Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Winifred Sullivan. I'm the chair of the Department of Religious Studies. Uh, welcome to the second of the fall lecture series. Um, uh, just to tell you, our third one will be on October 27th in this room at 530. And the speaker will be Kay Reed from DePaul University. Her lecture is entitled, Cooking the Cosmos, Ecologically Understanding Both the Aztecs and Ourselves. That on your calendar. Um, tonight, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce um, an old friend, Courtney Bender from Columbia University. Uh, Courtney is professor of religion. Uh, she holds a PhD in sociology uh, of religion from Princeton University, and she's the incoming chair at, of the department at Columbia. She also currently serves as chair of the Social Science Research Council's Interdisciplinary Research Initiative on Prayer. So, author of the incomparably titled Heaven's Kitchen, Living Religion at God's Love We Deliver, uh, a study of a Meals on Wheels program for AIDS patients in Boston. For the last decade or so, Courtney has been seeking to understand and describe American religion by reading, listening to, and hanging out with a significant, complex, and now centuries old phenomenon within American religion, those who are sometimes described or termed today as spiritual, not religious. Her second book is a historical account of American spirituality entitled The New Metaphysicals, Spirituality and the American Religious Imagination. Other essays and edited volumes investigating key terms and key moments in the life of American religion have built up an impressive collage that is Courtney's work, enriching and complicating our often simplistic account of what it means to be religious in America today and in the past. Her new project focuses on the spiritual lives, if you like, of modern artists and their patrons in New York City. You are in for a treat. Her title today is The Work of Art in the Age of Inarticulate Religion. Thank you. You took my talk. Oh. <laughs> that would be something. Thank you, thank you very much. Who is, okay, I will wave. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Lenny, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. I was uh, just saying um, that um, to many of this feels very exciting because it's a uh, way to strive to um, talk on a really, um, sort of really early stage um, set of um, thinking about some I think quite cool images and um, texts from the early 20th century. Um, I will um, begin though with a little in my space. You can just switch to the first. In February 1918, the Saturday Evening Post published The Christian Church, What of Its Future, an essay which opens appropriately enough for the day by invoking the hellish landscape of European battlefields, a quote vision so horrible it's hardly seen that it could be true. But John B. Rockefeller Jr., layman and Baptist Sunday school teacher, did not linger long on the atrocities in the trenches that seemed to resist human language. His aim, rather, was to show how the war had revealed, quote, a spirit of self-sacrifice and unselfishness at work all over Europe, wherein everyday people, acting on their own impulses, exhibited charity and, quote, brotherly love as it had never been manifested before. Rockefeller called this previously hidden force um, the religion of the inarticulate, a term he borrowed from a British soldier and correspondent named Donald Hankey. Rockefeller's appreciation of this religion of the inarticulate is tempered, characteristically perhaps, by his anxiety that the church might not be able to supply these masses with the language they need to channel these powers to their most noble end. He warned his readers that if the church found itself unable or unwilling to redirect this inchoate motive force, that Christianity would fail and humanity left impoverished. Rockefeller's widely circulated and discussed essay advanced no new ideas for liberal Christianity, according to William Hutchinson. And indeed, Rockefeller's view of the crisis at hand was unquestionably patrician. If the masses lacked a language, it was unquestionable also that the elites 
and the church in particular would have to step up and supply it. But even if Rockefeller's discussion was not his framing of the problem itself, in terms of the lack of language, or rather the religion of the inarticulate, resonates in interesting and notable ways with the broader set of concerns expressed by religious and non-religious American and European moderns alike. This was, in brief and in sum, the problem of language, a language crisis that had accompanied a widespread realization that words in modern life were unable to express or supply truth or what society might need for its future, that human language was not actually able to capture experience. The frame of this crisis of and in language, what was lacking, who lacked it, and what the solution might be, if any, underlies a large range of modern thinking uh, with many diverse answers. Switch. Donald Hankey, the Englishman and former seminarian who coined the term, argued Riley that the inarticulate working class, uh, uh, working class men of Britain, showed that true religion did not need a language at all. Joining working men as, as fellow soldiers in the barracks and sharing in the hard labor of surviving allowed him to, quote, grasp the fundamental fact that he is in inarticulate, this working man, and that he has no chance of being anything else. But this, Hankey said, did not lead the working men to lack religion. For he said, here were men who believed absolutely in the Christian virtues of unselfishness, generosity, charity, and humility. These Christ-like men were left cold by the chaplains who were sent to minister to them, an interchange, set of interchanges that led Hanky to offer the following observation. If the working man's religion is often fully inarticulate, the real religion of the educated man is often quite wrongly articulated. Henke would die in 1916 in the Battle of the Somme, his death a literal <coughs> reminder of the most common way that the times rendered a generation mute. More figuratively, the experience of total war galvanized by apparently unstoppable forces of modern life would be met with new theologies that sought to make its own sense of these new linguistic environments. Rudolf Otto das Heilige, published in 1917, explains, for example, the experience of the holy as the holy other as beyond words, an experience of which demands not explication, again, but silence in its presence and in its wake. Religious thinkers, soldiers, and seminarians were, as I've said, far from the only ones, preoccupied with this apparent failure of language to convey modern reality or to express the truth of things. Before the war's onset, similar interests and possibilities were galvanizing literary modernists, artists, and academics. And although this would play out in numerous ways, it is also reflected in artistic discussions about what the mute or apparently inarticulate thing or object could say. Hence, we should not um, find it surprising to hear that the, Max, uh, the painter Max Weber, you can switch this again, uh, the painter Max Weber, not to be confused with the social theorist of the same name, um, offering this opinion about the language of objects in a series of essays in art that was published in 1916. Culture has been too mental and too verbal. Schools and their isms and vagaries and social formalities have been detrimental to real culture. Culture will come only when every man will know how to address himself to the inanimate, simple things of life. A pot, a cup, a piece of calico, a chair, a mantle, a frame, the binding of a book, the trimming of a dress, these we live with. Culture will come when people touch things with love and see them with a penetrating eye. Weber's essays were based on lectures he gave in several art schools in Leeds and Manhattan. While he is not very well known today, at the time he was considered one of America's foremost modern artists and the first American um, to display an exhibit of Cubist works in Alfred Stieglitz's gallery in 1911. Jewish, born in Bialystok, raised in Brooklyn, trained in New York and in Paris in Matisse's salon, um, friends with Gertrude Stein and Mabel Dodge Lewin, and those circles, he was really not an outsider at all to modern arts avant-garde. Weber uses his essays to rail against the formalism and conservatism of art criticism and education in America, partially because his Cuba show in 1911 was so completely trashed by the critics, I think that this was sort of his rejoinder. Morons. Anyway, but he was railing against um, the critics 
and the um, art educators whom he thought confused intellectual knowledge of artistic technique or history with true understanding. Art historians and experts' emphasis on craft is not just wrong, but also dangerous, as he believed it closed off viewers to the real communicative power of art, the quote, spiritual communion with objects, that comes when people learn how to address themselves to images and objects. As Weber's essays reveal, what art needs, what real art of all kinds also enables, is a method of interaction and sensory skills that he calls spiritual tactility. Things mutually cry out to us, Faber writes, in a register that can only be viewed as enchanted. Sources like this. Objects cry, touch us, taste us, feel us, see us, understand us, learn us, make us more than what we are through our association, through your tactile and spiritual intimacy. A viewer can tell a true work of, of, of artistic quality, moreover, by using this spiritual tactility to connect to the infinite, or as he says, a true work of art ties us of the visible sphere to the sphere never to be metaphysically accounted for, but only spiritually felt. It binds us to godliness in the sphere that's most real. Faber's spiritualized claims for modern objects and modern artworks in particular might sound surprising if not altogether odd to us, given that we have often understood modern art, abstraction, post-representationality, and the like, as non-religious or post-religious. Indeed, if we religionists think of de the development of modern art at all, and usually we don't, um, it is Vedic art's a break with art's more explicitly religious pasts, including both religious patronage and religious representation. These ideas do not emerge from nothing. They were, in fact, widely shared by many of the contemporaries of Faber, Rockefeller, and Hanke. But numerous books and pamphlets published in this period both claimed modern art's distinctions from religious art and simultaneously linked it to the spiritual. That is, to what they understood to be spiritual ways of being in the world and spiritual senses that enabled proper viewing. The most familiar of books of this type is the painter Vasily Kandinsky's Concerning the Spiritual in Art, published first in German in 1910-11 and then in English in 1914. It's often noted for its explicit theosophical themes. Kandinsky's short treatise, not surprisingly, also focuses on language, arguing that painting, like music, has its own language, in this case, a color of language and its associations, that in the hands of a master can express and signify truths that exist in a register of other than words. Art, real art, expresses spiritual value. Yet, as this select volume's opening paragraphs, as we see here, also make clear, Kandinsky believes that modern viewers are ill-equipped to undertake the art, or under, understand the art that speaks the spiritual language. While Kandinsky's book differs from the American handbooks and pamphlets promoting modern art in any number of ways, and I won't go into the differences between the European and the American um, context, um, they all share concerns that we see here in building, the concern for building and appreciating audience for this new kind of work. And many of these books, like Kandinsky's and like Weber's, explicitly articulate the power of modern art as belonging to its spiritual qualities. In the remainder of this talk, I will consider some of the ways that some early modernists in the US came to explain the value of modern art and the conditions necessary to experience it through this register of the spiritual. You might ask, as I go forward, why would we be interested in this at all? I would leave a longer answer to that for some questions at the end if you want to pose it again. But briefly, what I want to say here right now is that I'm not out to say that all of modern art is spiritual, it is not, or that all American modernists were quasi-religious theosophists, because they also were not. Um, rather, my inquiry today is part of a larger research project regarding how modern American elites shaped forms of spirituality for themselves in a very, in very secular, 20th century institutions. And this inquiry, in addition, is a, and, and this is also an inquiry in addition to how these institutions and practices may, in fact, continue to influence our experience both of art and our understanding of what the spiritual is um, in the US. So this talk is a very small piece of this big project.
although a scant handful of modern art exhibits, including Weber's awful, awfully reviewed Cubist show. I actually think the show was probably pretty cool, but it was awful. Reviews were horrible. Um, it, there, although a scant handful of modern art exhibits had been held in New York City in the early 1900s, modern art was formally introduced to American critics and the wider public in 1913 at the International Exhibition of Modern Art um, in New York. Um, the reception of the Armory Show was mixed, but, the widely but it was at widely advertised and discussed in the press. The show was mobbed with curiosity seekers who hoped to be, to be alarmed or shocked by the strange abstractions that they found therein. Um, Marcel Duchamp's uh, New Descending a Staircase Number no. 2 was probably the most widely discussed among the thousands of work represented. It was housed in a special room that came to be known as the, as the um, Gallery of Horribles, um, and included um, some nudes by Matisse and others that also drew um, ire for their degeneracy. Switch. To the majority of viewers, apparently, such artwork was nonsense. The widely shared comment was that this work had nothing to say. Of course, it was easier for the press and the public to pronounce the artwork's inarticulate, inarticulateness than to query whether the problem lay in their own faulty faculties. This is just, I just have to show you this cartoon. Um, this sort of um, array, array of discourse around these objects um, is quite interesting, um, in part because if you just to sort of set a little bit of the stage here, um, and the challenge for the, um, the people who are actually the supporters of modern art, um, this image that you see here, a full color image um, that we might see, even say, for example, if you were to think about um, going to a gallery show now, um, you might see an image of what would, you would see there. Um, in 1913, um, you could not have a re full color reproduction of this artwork in any kind of widely circulated public, pu public um, press, newspapers, and so on. So, and often you couldn't even see uh, a black and white one. So the image itself is one that is not actually coming to the public, um, but sketches of and parodies of these things are the things that are circulating in the public. And of course, the question for these early um, people was like, how do you actually describe things that are supposed to be um, representational? So um, this is the sort of an interesting other sort of layer of um, of language issues that are attending to the ways that this stuff is put out in public. Um, that's not a new observation, but I think it's one that's interesting in relation to um, when we're talking about the spiritual qualities, spiritual qualities of this artwork, that these people are understanding it. Um, in any case, the widely shared public um, claim for modern art's nonsensical nature placed an onus on the components of modern art to explain how non-representational art should be understood. A challenge, as I said, that has been made even more challenging by the fact that these were rarely reproduced um, in any publication. Gallery owners, collectors, sympathetic critics, artists themselves, and other proponents of modern art um, were not, therefore, acting merely out of love for the, these paintings in their desire to promote a more positive view of this in public. Um, for many of these people, the gallery owners, the collectors, and the artists, um, it was very clear to them that without a public to appreciate their art, the art would, to put it very bluntly, would not appreciate in value. Um, so the onus on the, on the folks who were doing this work was to create a public so that they could actually have a future as artists and dealers themselves. Money is always front, front and center here. So within this social milieu in, this, in the 19-teens, um, it is perhaps not surprising that the given muteness and inscrutability and inarticulateness of modern art emerged as the very site of preoccupation in writing about modern art, and more, moreover one that I think also then sort of elicited what we might see as intense devotional activity around modern art. For as many argued, if modern art had something to say, it required a different set of senses. If spiritual, emotional, or soulful vibrations or meanings that took place beyond language were present in these paintings, then the ear and the eye needed to be differently trained. And as we can imagine, the trained ear or eye also required a trained body, able to engage this art in the proper setting and to take on the proper pose. 
Many also argued that such training took place in contact with the artworks themselves. It did not take place secondhand. For this, words were no substitute. So, as Max Weber actually writes in his book on how to understand modern art, I will quote, there is no art textbook, there is no school of the science of art, nor is there a lecture wherewith one can explain away what this art consciousness is. To try it is to drain it of its spirit. Such claims, however, did not put a check on the proliferation of writing about modern art. The teens in the 20s saw ever more, even into the 30s, saw ever more, many more pamphlets and books and lectures, many bent on explaining how only a transformed viewer or a viewer transformed by art could ever understand the art itself. Such a tautological vision of modern art's world transforming properties also appears in Western Art in the New Era, an introduction to modern art, a 1923 volume based on lectures by the artist and art dealer who you see here, Catherine Sophie Dreyer. Dreyer was the daughter of well-to-do parents of German immigrants who had settled in Brooklyn Heights in New York. Comfortable and well-connected, she did not need to work throughout her life and she did not marry, offering her life to so socially progressive causes and to painting. Starting in 1911, she also began a series of attachments to several metaphysical gurus, including a crypto-astrologist and a spiritualist, and a new thought breathing teacher. As an artist, she trained in New York and extensively in Europe, and on returning to New York, would exhibit a painting in the 1913 Armory Show, and in 1920, began the first Museum of Modern Art in the States, the Societe Anonyme, along with Man Ray and her lifelong friend, Marcel Duchamp. Dreyer's essays aspire to a more scholarly and comprehensive tone than Weber's metaphysical poetry. Nonetheless, her view that modern people have failed to understand the communicative power of modern art is a central theme. Modern painters, she argues, have sought to tap the deep recesses of human emo emotion and experience and connect to something that exists beyond our material world. Modern painting is therefore, she argues, much akin to the early artworks of primitive humans. The primitive, she argues, were not concerned about accurate representation, but rather about evoking or conjuring something beyond. That is, they knew what art could do. Thus, she argues, quote, the modern painter is more concerned with rendering the spirits inherent in the subject than with the outside material manifestation. Dreyer offers her readers um, some suggestions. Um, for how such art should be properly experienced. It is her firm conviction that these paintings are hard work to understand and demands patience, time, and full attention. Or, as Dreyer said in public lectures in the, in the early 1920s, quote, art demands relaxation. We see very little without relaxation. When we do relax, we will find that art, what art will reveal itself to us it does not matter what form of art enters our minds. When once we become conscious of the fundamental laws, we will apply them to our everyday lives. Opening up the inner eye, or the third eye, which she used interchangeably, through relaxation and appreciation of art would lead to spiritual progress of the viewer individually and eventually to the, uh, the progress of the culture as a whole. Now, Dreyer's understanding of relaxation draws on her experiences, as I've said, that she considered to be very hard work to relax. Uh, it drew on her experiences with various kinds of new thought teachings, which she avidly read, and the weekly meetings with the teacher and breathing expert that she had started to undertake um, in the late teens. As her journals and letters make absolutely clear, she never found relaxation to be particularly easy. Indeed, she regularly railed that everything in her life acted against her need to relax. But when she could manage it, her inner mind was sharpened, new awareness was possible, and she could find her way into the paintings that she loved. Concentrating on paintings was one way to exercise and expose the inner eye. Relaxation and spiritual tactility and other practices urged by volumes like these claim that the meaning of modern art revealed itself over time through repeated and sustained viewing and in the intimate spaces that might afford such tactility. Weber said, quote, it may be said to happen and to be when we feel the reality 
or when matter, light, sound, temperature reaches or touches it, us. It may be said to be the spiritual consciousness. It is like the finger touching the organ. Resonant, reverberating through actual and imagined touch, touching indeed on the erotic, these handbooks imagine a kind of silent communication with works of art made possible by the collapse of distance between the work of art, the viewer, and the cosmic whole. Now, handbooks and um, teachings and little essays of this life are very challenging documents to place in social life, of course. Um, we might ask, and the sociologist in me does certainly uh, want to know who read them or who took them seriously. Alas, the records are slim. We do not know whether Dreyer, Weber, and others um, were, um, had very many um, readers. Actually, we know, that Dreyer, we know that Dreyer didn't sell very many of her books. I can tell you she kept very clear um, records of every copy that was sold, and she did not have many. But anyway, they, these were, um, so we don't know, actually, in a certain way, um, or in any way, um, how much these books proliferated in public, even though there were many of them that were published. Um, but we also do know that Dreyer and Faber and others were not just writing about, but were actually actively involved in organizing the galleries and other spaces where this new art could be viewed. And in this, I think, these gallery spaces offer a different view into the practices of spiritually engaging modern art. As I've already noted, um, with the exception of a half dozen or so large but very short-lived international expositions, these big expositions of thousands of paintings. They're really the only public places to see modern art in New York at this time were in um, the galleries of dealers. There were also private salons, um, which some of which are quite um, notorious. Um, but largely, if you were a public just interested, you would need to go to basically a shop. Um, after 1920, um, however, the Society Anonyme um, opened up in Midtown. This is their first um, advertising flyer that went out. Um, I think it's sort of cute. Um, and a little bit of the um, text from uh, what Catherine Dreyer thought they were doing, which was to create this um, stimulating vital manifestation. Um, The modern, this modern museum of art, however, was actually quite small, housed in, on one single floor of the brownstone in, in midtown Manhattan and consisting of two rooms. Duchamp, however, hung the art, sometimes with an explicit Dadaist intent. There was sort of a circulating group of paintings that were, that were put up, um, but always with plenty of white space around each painting. The individual artworks to be, were to be viewed individually, but also, as this next um, slide will show, this postcard actually from um, the society, um, in light of each other as well. And you can sort of make out, this is a Duchamp um, artwork that is glass, and behind it, on the windowsill, there's a Grand Cousy sculpture. This is one of the things this is, and so you see sort of an interaction here that was sort of very much intended by a dryer to have some kind of conversation. More importantly, however, uh, visitors to this museum were encouraged to stay as long as they wished, with chairs available for those who wished to sit. Members could check out books from its extensive library of catalogs and art books. Dreyer, who was the guiding intellectual and financial light of this endeavor, organized and advertised well-attended weekly talks at the galleries when she and artists of the art hanging on the walls sometimes on um, spending time explaining and discussing the particular works on display. As the society's collection expanded, so did Dreyer's lecture circuit. She lectured widely and to anyone who would listen to her. She gave lectures in union halls, universities, and social clubs, and even local churches. She also took what might seem to us to be the unusual step of taking original works of art with her, either offering to mount small shows with pop-up shows of artworks, or at times even dragging a particular Archipenko or Stella along with her in her car. Dreyer was not ignorant of the value of the work she loaned or occasionally carted around in taxis, far from it, and she would actually abandon this practice of car dragging artwork by the mid-1920s. Um, yet through her life, Dreyer was, in, Dreyer was insistent that learning about modern art demanded being in its presence. Ideally, that presence 
would be sustained through constant contact, an approach that she tried didactically to express, in, as we'll see in this next slide. Um, curating um, an, inter an international exhibition of modern art at the Brooklyn Museum in 1926, which included two rooms that put modern art in situ, that is, in a mock living room and dining room, which you can see here on the two sides of this passageway. Um, that showed, in fact, modern art as it should be used in homes, um, part of the daily encounter that people have with their objects. Dreyer's efforts to create and encourage intimate encounters for modern art throughout the city went on in parallel with the projects of the photographer Alfred Stieglitz, whose intimate gallery you see here, arguably did the most to make a form of spiritual modernism explicit for his contemporaries. Stieglitz, in addition to being an artist, was also an impresario of modern art. He was the first one, as he was very excited to tell everyone until he died. Um, he was the very first one to display Picasso in the US and at his gallery 291, also where Baker had exhibited. And he was the founding F um, editor of camera work. He was part of the photo-secessionist movement and he was also the consort of Georgia O'Keeffe. Stieglitz's 291 gallery, a precursor to the Intimate Gallery, was described by contemporaries as, quote, a religious fact, a little altar in which life was worshiped above the noise of a dead city. Here was a refuge certain and solitary from the tearing grip of the industrial order. This feeling was shaped explicitly so by Stieglitz's approach to displaying art and photography that many viewed as radical. He stripped art of ornamentation and used very simple frames, if any at all. All images were placed at eye level and well lit. There were no signs or placards near the art, a practice that many would follow and would continue to be hotly contested. Art, said Stieglitz, should be judged for its own value, not for a label attached. He, quote, wanted viewers to respond to the art independently based on what he deemed their own internal emotional resonance. Stieglitz's circle shaped by deep interest in both American transcendentalism and in machine age photographic possibilities had a very complicated and vexed relationship with urban life. Stieglitz closed the 291 gallery in 1917 and left for New Mexico with O'Keeffe. He returned to New York in the 1920s and opened the Intimate Gallery in 1925 to display the works of just a few chosen artists. As you see here, it invited all those who were not overtired to come. He would, as he said, direct the spirit of the room. The intimate gallery was, in fact, tiny and often very crowded. But as art historian Christina Wilson has noted, this tininess was part of the plan. The, quote, the sensuous art and small crowded space encouraged visitors to be aware of their embodied existence and in turn of their place in the larger physical and spiritual universe. While viewing modern art would move from the gallery to the museum in decades to come, these early modes of presentation would be widely adopted. Indeed, the styles of display that Stieglitz and Dreyer and others deployed may now seem commonplace to us. But at the time, most galleries were a hodgepodge um, most, most galleries and museums were a hodgepodge and complaints about museum display that there was too much to see, there was too much crowding in, um, things were not lit and so on echoed in the writings of museum educators as well as visitors. An early museum educator like Mr. Gilman, here taking pictures sort of of himself um, for an essay titled Museum Fatigue, um, noted that visitors um, faced with too many artworks or too many images to see um, faced with badly placed and poorly lighted um, displays, would barely spend any time looking. Stieglitz and Dreyer, in showing what kind of display modern art works demanded in their own galleries, also became in innovators in art display more broadly in the Northeast and then around the country. We still walk around in museums where the hope of silence, stillness, and intimacy is on display. To return to the Intimate Gallery, however, for a moment, Stieglitz was widely known not to sell any art from the Intimate Gallery unless he believed that the prospective buyer had been called by the artwork to own it. 
Stieglitz and Dreyer both recorded stories of prospective collectors who failed to live up to Stieglitz's challenge. And on occasion, there's also the story of Stieglitz offering a painting at deeply reduced rates to those whose pocketbooks were bare, but whose souls were obviously full. The intimate gallery was, at every step, a commercial space. And as such anecdotes tell us, spiritual tactility and intimacy were made possible through purchase. But such activity was, thanks to their efforts, quickly becoming an elite pursuit. Times were changing. Mrs. John B. Rockefeller Jr., whose husband hated modern art, would purchase her first modern artwork in 1925. And by 1929, she would, along with three friends, found the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The 1930s, what is a consequence, show itself to be a quite different moment for articulating the spiritual in modern art in New York City. New actors and institutions, including the MoMA and what would become the Guggenheim, would elaborate quite different and, in fact, competing con conceptions of modern art's spiritual purchase and its proper display. These institutions did not replace the spiritual views I've discussed tonight with something more secular, but rather, I believe, established a different register of secular spiritual visions of modern art and of the potentials of its viewers. While these changes lay beyond the scope of this presentation, I will look a bit ahead chronologically and in lieu of really a proper conclusion, which you'll forgive me, offer you an exchange between Catherine Dreyer and Alfred Barr, the young MoMA director who was hired by the Rockefellers um, at the inception of the opening of the museum. In 1936, the Society Anonymes collection was still much, much stronger than the MoMA's. Um, in fact, sort of embarrassingly so. Um, and Barr, um, who wanted to put up exhibits, frequently found himself calling on Dreyer for loans for exhibits in New York and elsewhere. So in late 1935, Barr requested more than a dozen works from as many artists for a major exhibition. Dreyer complied with this request and put the machinery in motion for the loans. When the works reached the MoMA, its registrar dutifully noted the wear and damage to each work, including nail holes, small tail tears, scratches, and so on. A copy of this was sent to Catherine Dreyer. Dreyer, who was already irritated by the special status that MoMA was affording itself in the world of modern art, took umbrage. She had, of course, already founded the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which nobody had seemed to remember at this point. Um, while a copy of her um, reply to Barr is not, or her letter to Barr is not in her personal papers, a letter to Mary, her sister, on the same day notes her displeasure at Barr's lacking, quote, the emotion and intelligence required to understand modern art. She had just written to Barr, she tells her sister Mary, divulging to him her fears that, quote, there is not a lot, enough love in the museum and that her paintings had to be protected by love. We do have Barr's reply, seen here. He tells Dreyer that he loves the paintings too. He says, and argues that the best way to love a painting is to assess it, to note its problems. Viewing the very traces of love that Dreyer's and others had left on the painting as false, certainly, and their meaning anyway, um, certainly changes their meaning, and I believe indicates the beginning of the end of an age of spiritual tactility, when modern paintings circulated in relations of love, where they were touched and where their spiritual meaning and power rested in their ability to be engaged in this way, when they were spiritual objects in the language of those who bought and sold them, the day of intimacy and devotion in modern art would come to a close, probably before 1936, but this is a good moment to mark it. But at least for a very short moment, modern works of art became a form of sacred commodity that not only could be bought, bought and sold, but which could, by their presence, perform also the act of bringing forth new modes of communication, new modes of communication into a world that appeared to cry out desperately for them. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, I was struck by that picture at the beginning of the, I guess it was the guys in barracks, and um, that was part of the inarticulate, the workers and the right. inarticulate sea. And right. then, um, and of course, then the absence of crowds thereafter, mm -hmm. or, or anything like any, any visual representation, at least, of community. But I guess, I think probably this is a, a question about your broader, your larger mm -hmm. project, but um, I think I missed or would love to hear you talk more about the, the move from the, the workers and what mm -hmm. they represent in terms of what it is to be mm -hmm. inarticulate and what, what sort of vacuum or what sort of absence their inarticulacy or their right. inarticulacy is representing and what the, the sort of the art is filling that space. Is mm -hmm. that kind of like Well, I mean, I think this is a very, I'm still sort of working out, I mean, just to sort of when I started poking around in this to, to see the sort of like the different so the problem, as I mentioned at this time, was language, right? I mean, so, but like how that was sort of being mobilized, this problem in all of these various ways that are completely running orthogonally to each other and having different really sort of meanings is, is quite interesting. So, um, I mean, the, so one of the things that I find particularly interesting about um, this period also is when you have all these anxieties about the masses, right? So this is also when, um, the French social scientists are being quite concerned with the mass, the mob, and so on, right? So this is a, so Hanke in particular is sort of putting a spin on this by saying that in fact the articulateness is not a lack, but it's in fact an alternate um, register, right? That is sort of outside of language. And, you know, with this sort of pseudo-Marxist sort of thing, uh, I mean, yeah, he's not a Marxist, so that's why it's pseudo-Marxist that, um, you know, that they work so hard that they are not actually in the position to gain a language. So Subaltern speak is another way of sort of thinking that, right? So, but anyway, but this 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 problem, right? So, um, and so that opening of um, of Hanke's is where there's another language here that's being spoken that others can't hear. It, that is, you know, sort of um, is the opening also that we hear within the modern avant-gardists who are trying to explain that something is happening in, I mean, one of their ways that they're imagining what is happening in modern art um, when they're talking about this is that there's another language um, that is connecting, um, that's not words, but all, you know, this other sort of spiritual register that is connecting, um, you know, sort of theosophical, I mean, if it were the theosophical people talking, it would be the register where, you know, sort of universal spirituality is sort of beyond language, but it sort of dips down into every culture, right? Or you could have it as the, um, the sort of the great sort of openness of uh, uh, experience or emotion and so on. So, so whatever that other language is, right? But the transformation in that, which and Constance is going well too far beyond, is also, of course, as we see in some of Stieglitz's um, practices, um, one that is very um, socially divisive. Right, so um, the modernists have really no interest in the masses, mostly as we would expect, right? So, but to sort of um, outdo, in a way, it sort of outdoes the Rockefellers, right? So Rockefeller says, oh, we have to give them a language. And, you know, they, these modernists, I think, are sort of, sort of well beyond that, sort of well beyond the sort of patrician. They hate that, they think it's disgusting, it's sort of bourgeois, right? So they just want to live in this world of this cosmopolitan alternative language. Um, and did they write about? Primitives ever intersect with their language with any with any sort of pedagogical interest in art for the masses or no? Well, I, I mean, so I, we see so we see for example, um, uh, Dreyer who was very interested in sort of uh, she she's sort of a bridge figure. She's um, sort of much more interested in art for the masses and um, but um, they but but the vision of someone like Dreyer, um, depending on what day she's who she's writing to, right? Sometimes it's like art for the masses and. Can lift them all up, and the others is the reason that we take the art to the masses is that there might be people there who actually have the third eye or can, you know, be a, the individual who we can pull up, the chosen person we can pull up out of the mass. So, um, you know, I, I think it's still sort of where I'm. I'm quite interested in the sort of social, um, the real sort of Bordeauxian distinction work that's going on here. The you know sort of the raise an elite culture and the language of spirituality that can be um, used in a sort of post-Christian way um, as a truly um, distinctive sort of way of thinking about and being in the world and those sort of things. So that's really what I'm 
puzzling over. So that's, I'm sorry, it's a very long answer. I hope that's um, helpful in some way. Thank you, first of all. Um, I, I have a couple of comments, and um, maybe neither of them will actually go anywhere. Let's see. Um, I was struck, uh, it's been a while since I've read the Kandinsky, but I was struck by what looked to me very much like a contrast between um, the sorts of worry that Kandinsky expresses, at least in the paragraphs that you mm -hmm. placed before us, and the sort of worry that someone like Gilman expresses, right? I mean, for Kandinsky, it seems that the problem is not so much with the fact that there's an overabundance of art, right? There's no sense of museum fatigue. It's that we're looking in the wrong place. We're looking right. toward textualized representations rather than mm -hmm. encountering what's before right. us. Right, absolutely. Right. And so that seems a very different yes. source of complaint than, than the Gilman, yes. right? Okay, good. I want to make sure that. Yes, 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 thank you. Okay, great. Um, the other point is just to say that um, I, I wonder about how much Dreyer is actually um, sort of a, a representative of um, suspicions about. Uh, uh, language, um, and I'm not sure you actually said that she was a representative of that, but it seems to me that when she's saying that one must relax, you must relax, right? One must relax. Um, <laughs> and so on. Right, yeah. In order to, um, at the end of the day, as it were, perceive the fundamental laws, right? It's not so that you can feel something that somehow escapes the net of language, right? I mean, right. those sorts of claims do get made by aesthetic critics yeah. and artists and so forth, but it's not, oh, I have the transcendent, Unsummarizable, unthematizable ethos, right? Instead, it's it's something much more like there's a law, and if it's a law, if it really is sort of down underneath surface appearances, mm -hmm. but it's a law, that sounds very much like a language of something expressible that we just haven't mm -hmm. quite found our way toward the expression of yet. Yeah, that's interesting. So. Um which is, I think, sort of a little bit more what her conception of these fundamental laws are, right? That they, you know, that you have sort of scientific principles of, um, well, gravity is the obvious example, but, you know, these, that the way things work. So she, um, she, and here I maybe am, I mean, here I am reading her as a, as a really sort of new thought thinker, so that part of her last saying is to sort of come into conformance with the way things are. Right, and so the part of the way things are, they are, they may, we might be able to describe what gravity is, but gra gravity is not actually um, experienced in our discussion of it, right, it just is, right? So I think that she has, insofar as that is a new thought sort of gloss, right, that there are the spiritual laws of um, the organization of the universe, right, to, and <coughs> artworks, these modern artworks are expressive of that and bring people into closer communion, so this is, it's a, I mean, one of the things that I probably did not stress enough in the talk but that I should is that all of these sort of spiritual languages that these varieties of people have are very different. I mean, they all speak the space of spirit, sexuality, and so on, but they have very different sort of uh, things that they're pulling on to make right. this, this work. And I mean, they've all, you know, they're all sort of like scared of German idealism. And, you, know, I, you know, so it's, I mean, there's a big bunch of um, stuff there. So. Um, I do think, so yeah, she, she has a different sort of idea about what's inarticulate and what is possible to be articulate about, I think, than the others. Um, the point about Gilman, just to touch on that for a moment, is that um, the problem, I mean, I, what I think is really quite interesting is that um, when the museum people um, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, where the Gilman worked, for example, when they started to think about, so how should we do this differently? How should we? Um, the models and examples that they that are actually already present um, are, and the people who they actually often end up talking to are people like Stieglitz. Um, so that while the religious stuff is not necessarily translating, certainly the model of how to do this um, is present in the world, and it's not sort of created. For, it's a sort of mimetic thing. Um, so that was the only point that I was making with this, that, that sort of gesture into the transfer. But they're very different. Yeah. I mean, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Yeah, Jim. Um, <clears throat> I know this project's in its, its early stages, so this this question might be unfair. And you, you can no, say, no, no, you, no, you, you can say I don't fine. know. You can, you can just say, yeah. I don't know yet. Um, I was, I was, um, Hearing at least at least two things in the talk, and I'm, um, partly this goes to Constance's question, I think. 
Are, do, you, do you see this project moving more in the direction of a sort of synchronic account of a Bourdieuian uh, field of cultural production mm -hmm. in, the teen, in the teens and 20s, or something more like a, a diachronic account of um, um, engagement with the crisis of language? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, maybe maybe neither of those things. Okay, so okay. I mean, I think that so what I I think this crisis of from what I'm sort of where I'm at right now is that the crisis of language is a very sort of generative and mobilizing sort of set of things in the teens and immediately in and after the first world, the Great War context, um, and that then there are other issues to be honest that sort of so once you get into the 30s, and once you get into the um, uh, there are a different set of players, a different set of issues, um, a different set of registers in which um, we see, you know, you think that these, not to be gesturing to, but you know, that Dreyer and so on, they're sort of out of the picture and they're sort of like crazy talk about, you know, talking to the teacups, to sort of like, you know, forget that, you know, and then we move into the, the MoMA, and, you know, it's all sort of nice and austere and, um, you know, vaguely Protestant and, you know, thank God all those people have gone away, right? But there's, <laughs> Um, you know, but this is, you know, I mean, this is the way my art historian friends would sort of go with me, right? But then you go into the 30s, and then you have the Guggenheim, uh, which is developing and on a totally different um, sort of, you know, reviving the Kandinsky language and reviving ideas about display and so on. And, you know, so there's, there's these sort of, um, it is a diachronic project, and what I'm tracking are the sort of problematic nexuses in well, not really just decade by decade, but sort of overlapping institutionally in the ways that they are um, shaping out. I'll probably, I mean, I'm, this, the project doesn't really have a terminus point yet, but I do think that it will be probably right after the Second World War at this point. It's, uh, the 60s are so cool. Hi. Um, uh, thank you. I, I have uh, two uh, questions or comments. and. Um, one of them is uh, is in reference to I believe it was Steve that's describing his own intimate gallery, mm -hmm. which he, he referenced it almost as a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering, one, in terms of the creation of, of this new space in which to experience and visualize and interact and uh, engage art is is uh, in, in his conceptualization or his uh, comrades mm -hmm. that it's um, a new church right. notion. So that that's one component of it, and then. And, and are they doing that because they think old church has outlived its usefulness, mm -hmm. and so that there needs to be a new space mm -hmm. in which to have uh, spiritual experiences? Mm -hmm. And one thing, just as an aside, that struck me is there's that fabricated quotidian of having <coughs> kitchen and dining room, yeah. although it's not really a kitchen and a dining room, and so that even the space of this new sanctuary is supposed to be something more prosaic, and yet. Right. Okay, so that, that, that one, I'm just curious if you yeah. could speak more of that about what they might have thought in those terms or how they conceptualize it. And then the other one, when I, when, when I first became aware of your talk, and, and, uh, and I mentioned it in one of my classes earlier today, was um, and especially this idea of uh, religion and articulate. I, I thought uh, of Karl Barth and second edition to the Epistle to the Romans, and which, did, which then led me to the, the idea or, or the memory that I have of there's an image that he had in his student, in his own personal study. Uh, it's a miniature replica of Matthias Grunewald's uh, crucifixion, which is this very contorted image of Christ crucified, but it's from the early 16th century. And, uh, and which then led me to think about, uh, in the early 20th century up until the, through the 1920s, and I'm sure even after that, there's a recovery of El Greco, Mm -hmm. uh, and other early art that mm -hmm. is now considered to be some kind of the representational of this modern experience of the of what's inarticulate in religion. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm curious, because what, what you primarily focus on are people who are creating art at that moment, right. but rather a parallel event yeah. in, which, in which people are recovering That's earlier really art and reconfiguring it as, a, as the way to yeah. also experience this inarticulateness. That's totally great, and I didn't know about that, and I, I mean, I, so I have to think about that um, a little. I really have to think about that more. So, but I. But what is so? Um, I mean, what I can tell you, what I do know. I mean, about that is, I'm sure that you you know as well as 
I do that um, you know American American Protestants sort of in this period are very interested in sort of visual lessons, but they want representational images that America. This is the stuff I've been reading anyway. So they want you know David Morgan's you want Jesus. They want you know sort of things that will lift up. Um, a certain kind of moral character in the person who's confronting you. So, but I hadn't, I wasn't aware of the recovery of the earlier um, stuff in relation to the inarticulate. So that's well. I, so. I, know, I know, for example, in, in 1921, the Royal, the British Royal Academy has an exhibition of, of Spanish art, in which El Greco is a uh -huh. central component of it. And also, there's this British magazine called the Burlington Magazine, which goes through this period also in the first two decades of the 20th century, trying to make sense of El Greco in particular in, in the context of what they're experiencing in the early 20th century. And so, the, and of course, there's a pre-1914 component of that, a 1914-1918 component, and then an then interwar component. So I just thought that that could be a yes. interesting parallel. Okay. And then the other one that was about Stieglitz and his, his church. Right, so Stieglitz was, um, Stieglitz did have a, he had like a posse at, uh, you know, they were, uh, you know, it's Lewis Mumford and the people who like it from this, um, you know, like O'Keefe and Dove and all these sort of modern writers and artists and so on who he really cultivated. He had a really strong, uh, I mean, the people around him actually considered, they talked to him like in very religious language, father, priest, all these mm -hmm. kinds of, um, and sometimes I think not very tongue in cheek. Um, and really, you know, so he was like the minister of the modern. And um, he wore this mantle very lightly, I would say. It was, you know, it was um, uh, in, with joy. I, he didn't do much with joy, but I think he actually, he, he did not mind. Um, and, but, and he, he was very, um, uh, I mean, one of his most, he, he was not religious. He was Jewish. He was, um, you know, but had not been raised in a particularly religious home, and um, so he was outside of the sort of American Protestant experience from, you know, growing up. So the church, whether wherever this sort of religious language and play that he is playing with, is very much in an oppositional, or at least a playful sort of term, but also in a very serious way in offering um, uh, an alternative to modernity. But you know, a, a a set of practices and aesthetics to sort of deal and cope with modernity. So um, he's very he's very complicated. I, I mean, I think, in, which is one of the reasons why next week I'll be back up with you all and have some trouble to talk about this. But you know, he was stuff like you know, like this is not a religion. I'm against all isms. You know, the next placard for the intimate gallery will say that. You know, so at the same time, his most famous image is called Spiritual America, which is an image of a horse being gelded or something like this. So you know, it's a very um, Complex man. Now, but there's one more thing that I want to point to, and if you could go ahead, I had a couple of slides. Not that one. That one. Not that one. This one. So um, this is the first place that um, the Guggenheim Museum had its open exhibitions in 1935. This was Solomon Guggenheim's actual bedroom. Um, so you could sign up. It was called the Museum of Non-Objective Painting, and you could sign up and take a tour. And so, you know, this is, in 1935, this is sort of an interesting statement. They, you know, eventually the, they went to this space, and then they went to the Frank Lloyd Wright space, but, you know, I think there's a really interesting story here about intimacy and domesticity that is really um, sort of ripe for the, for the telling. Um, where, you know, there's really, I think, true statements being made about, you know, like, you must live with this art in order to understand it. You must, um, you know, you must imagine yourself in this kind of space that, you know, in fact, going to the gallery is always going to be second rate because, you know, so. You know, the great parallel there is the prayer closet, like the early modern prayer closet. And, yeah. Yeah, and it's 1935, which is just, it, I mean, the class, Consciousness of that is awesome. It, it, it makes, it <laughs> makes, Tell me what you see. <laughs> it makes Peggy Guggenheim seem passe. I don't know if you ever seen her her gallery in yeah. Venice. I mean, but it's you walk into her house and everything's displayed like that. I mean, there are tables and chairs. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but that doesn't open publicly until after the Second World War. And so now I know where she got it. From, <laughs> from her uncle. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, I think we'll, do you have a question? Uh, I was thinking the meaning about the inarticulate in this as a problem, and where does this come from? Is it, you, the only reference I thought I heard at the beginning was about World War One. Right. And I'm thinking, is this the same kind of crisis, kind of base crisis of language that happens every time there's a giant cataclysmic event mm -hmm. in a society? Or is there, and so that this is just the epiphenomenal kind of response to that particular just Right. Is it from this core problem, or is there a particular kind of inarticulateness at this time? Well, I mean, so what I, um, I think that the short answer is it's not just the war, right? So it's it that the short answer is probably not available to me. But the, the, the beyond that, that um, um, you think about literary modernism, you it, so you think about, uh, for example, uh, James Joyce, who's you know sort of monumental works are being produced before the war where you know the sort of um, where the um, where if you know you know like the language what does it signify it's just you know is it just words is it the, you know what is this um, um, uh, so um, so is the course in general in linguistics which is separating you know from observing the sort of a, a different kind of relationality and language that you know that you know, naming things doesn't make that thing, but in fact there's a sort of larger representational structural understanding of language that actually is wrenching meaning from the word, um, you know, causing all kinds of sort of interesting things to happen. There's um, the Italian futurists, even before, like long, well, again in 1911, are, um, you know, with their manifesto, it, um, this was a, I'm sorry, I'm sort of thinking about a recent exhibit I've seen, but where, um, uh, words are taken out of the context of, of meaning and placed in, um, uh, from seven to different register of meaning, they're, they are made into art, you know, so you have art words that are not really words, so nonsense. So, but this like very large um, set of explorations within um, these, within literary cultures, aesthetic culture in Europe, um, primarily not in the US actually, um, um, I would say. So the crisis is actually sort of a playful, exciting, sort of angsty one, but not, you know, it's a very different, and then when the, it's, it's, it also has some deeper um, political registers. But the, so the war, I think, is sort of takes it in this different direction where you have the sort of horror of war, you have a different kind of inarticulateness, you have the complete absence of words, um, you know, you have the silence, which is a different thing than the ways that the modernists have been playing. So again, I, this goes back to um, uh, Constance's first sort of like, where is the inarticulateness? And it's like, it really depends on where I, you begin, what you find in terms of the thing. Is that helpful at all? Okay, thank you. Uh, you have a question here? Okay. Okay, Candy. Um, Early in your talk, you hinted that you might have some thoughts about what this means for kind of more recent mm -hmm. material, uh, kind of, um, which of course some of your previous work has, mm -hmm. has really focused on kind of mm -hmm. what's going on now. So I'm, I'm just curious to hear you reflect upon where you see this kind of historical engagement kind of um, maybe helping you to revisit some of your thoughts about current ideas of spirituality mm -hmm. and religion. And, I mean, because here, I mean, I, I, I could imagine this going in the direction of um, tactility and kind of spirituality and religion being kind of a, a broader than Protestant version mm -hmm. of kind of um, perception and kind of the body. And, and I, I don't know if that's right. what you want to do with this, but I, I just love to hear you reflect upon yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so, so the answer, um, so I'll tell you maybe one thing to be would be helpful is how I actually got interested in this at all. Because yeah. as you know, I've, um, many of you may know, I'm an ethnographer and my main focus is on very contemporary stuff. Mm -hmm. So not you know, 100 years seems like a <laughs> another millennium <laughs> to me. Um, um, not really, but it's, um, it's exciting for me to move into this historical material. But um, where it, this really got started, um, this is sort of a true story, but it's mostly a true story. But I was at a, um, I was giving a talk on my earlier book, um, 
which is about uh, metaphysical religions and its connection to 19th century principally. And um, a very distinguished sociologist sort of turned to me who was the discussant and he said, well, you know, Courtney, you know, all these 19th century people, they're so interesting and they're so intellectual, you know, like William James and, um, you know, all of, um, you know, Henry James even, we, you know, all of these, you know, 19th century people, like, they're, this is the cosmopolitan world theosophy, it's a very cosmopolitan movement, it's very elite and so on. And then he says, well, you know, when you get to sort of like 1910, it all sort of falls apart and becomes kitsch and becomes therapeutic and becomes very middle brow. And he's like using this language that's, you know, sort of the language of, you know, push it away. And, 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 there were, and I said, I thought to myself, I was telling the graduate students this earlier, that I, that really bothered me because I actually didn't think it was true, but I didn't actually know how to answer the question, right? So the question for me really is posed, where does um, elite, where, what happens in the early 20th century? What are, where does theosophy go, right? Does it really just sort of go down market? Does it also move into other kinds of, you know, upmarket elite um, social structures? Um, and, um, or the same with any of these other theosophical mo movements. So what I'm really trying to do is to, um, I mean, if they do, and I think that they do with examples like this, that, they, that there is a sort of very elite sort of language of spirituality and sort of sense of practices and institutions that carry that along in American cosmopolitan society that, that actually has implications for the ways that um, communities come together and the elites um, across religious lines, for example. Um, then it actually may demand that we actually rethink the sort of language we have to use about therapeutic culture in America the 20th century as a very middle ground kind of movement. So that's sort of the, the question and the Can talk. you expand on that just a little bit about kind of what this expansion is? Well, I mean, so, so I mean, one way to think about what my esteemed colleague um, said to me, who is himself a sort of, um, it is to, to look at it as a, um, um, his response as a, um, as boundary work, right? Where that, you know, we can be, that if the spiritual, which is so, you know, sort of icky to so many people, is sort of kept out of, um, you know, out of sight, or if it's sort of suggested as something else, then it has a certain other kind of space to flourish, right? Um, um, I think, um, I it's a it's a way of um, it also helps us to think about. Um, the languages that we hear um, people in, there used to be an elite, in the sort of a highbrow elite um, in the United States um, using. It helps us to understand um, Greenberg's very famous and important essays on uh, modern art as, which he's, I mean, why does he begin with this statement in the first paragraph in 1939? There is nothing metaphysical about modern art. Like, why would he even bother saying that if there weren't, like, many people at the time, who in fact thought there was something very metaphysical about modern art. I mean, it's sort of, you know, you don't have to say things that are obvious, right? So if you, you, um, you know, Adorno's work on uh, on the occult, which is also sort of part of this, the culture war, or not the culture war, but the mass, mass um, culture industry um, arguments of the mid 20th century, um, we can we see those not as places where the secular is sort of impugning the religious middle brow, but rather where a sort of cosmopolitan spiritual formation is trying to distinguish itself from and sort of hide itself from um, its near neighbor, which is the middle brow. So I think that's what um, I'm coming towards thinking, and I think that that's, I mean, not to say like, haha, I'm exposing you, and you know, that's not the effort, but rather the effort is to say, you know, that many of these things that we think of as being secular and that institutions like this and that are in fact secular are also um, carriers of um, uh, kinds of, um, uh, well, carriers of um, American spirituality. And so just to sort of put that out there more broadly to say it's not just just like united together, the yoga studios and so on, but you know, our major institutions might be kind of interesting to think about that. So I might be wrong too, though. I might actually decide to be End of doing this project that um, you know my team probably was right. In which case, that's fine too. It's still a pretty good story. So I just had a little addendum. Mm -hmm. I, 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 
it, it also is a way to separate the spiritual from the social. Like that in the mm -hmm. line where he says it has no social function mm -hmm. in his intimate thing, mm -hmm. that seems really key to everything that you are mm -hmm. playing out. Yes. Thank okay, you. sorry, with the last question. Okay. Um, it's, I'm going to float a theory. Uh, <laughs> so, a bunch of the guys that you have here and their guys are Jews. Mm -hmm. And I spend up some time. Really? <laughs> <this time here. laughs> uh, and so, so here's my here's my theory, and I would love for you to tell me why it's wrong or why it makes sense. Or okay. Um, I think that for them, the idea of inarticulate religion isn't going to be, although they wouldn't use quite those words, is not terrifying, right? They come from a tradition without. Mm -hmm. um, any buy-in to some cohesive or coherent or articulable theology, mm -hmm. right? So the absence of that or um, or something that looks inarticulate um, to them is, I, I thought about this when you were answering Will's question about the, the playfulness with words, yeah. the ambiguity, the made up words, right? That stuff is all very familiar to them. So they're, um, they're relatively newly secular um, Jews in the grand scheme of the Jewish mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if they're not, I mean, I wonder if it's more a convergence in American, cosmo, in American cosmopolitan atmosphere mm -hmm. um, of that tradition. So what are we doing? Well, we could articulate a rational um, Judaism with a coherent theology. And mm -hmm. there's a strong element of that going on at the same time. But these folks, it seems like, are saying, like, look, no, we're not going to do that, but we want to hang on to some sort of spirituality. So I think we could maybe, I would say it's a convergence rather than, than attributing to them some sort of theosophical or crypto-theosophical. No, no, right, like, exactly. It seems no. to me that they're coming from a rather different place and yet ending up with some similar language. Yeah, right. Well, there are many, I mean, there are many sort of rubulets that are sort of working in this, and it's very hard to not think about individuals in this case, but you're absolutely right that Faber and Stieglitz are like not crypto theosophists. They have like no interest in that stuff. Faber in particular is sort of his language is, um, well, I mean, in the sense that Stieglitz actually has like sort of some interesting ideas about the transcendentalists and sort of like goes that direction for a while and sort of comes back. So, but I think that the, um, I mean, what I find really interesting about this, um, uh, stuff is that, or what I'm, what I'm really sort of trying to piece together, and what I find interesting, and I'm trying to piece together is um, the one. I mean, I think that part of the social fa function, despite the fact that they say it has no social function, the part of the social function of art collection and these modern art museums that are going to take shape is that they actually um, are much more ecumenical, we might say, than most of the other boards and most of the other cultural institutions. In New York City, they, um, they, you know, religious connections, which very much are organizing, say, through the patrons and the trustees, are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art or um, the Museum of Natural History. Right, that these things are very Christian and they're very, you know, but these other new institutions that form are immediately um, uh, multi-religious. There, I mean, at least the sort of, I mean, but not that, not that anybody's actually that religious, but it's so. So you see already, I think that what's happening here is that there is a space for um, um, American secular Jews to participate in this cosmopolitan culture and to use these kinds of languages that are, I mean, they don't have to be crypto theosophists they don't also have to be Protestants, they can just be doing this stuff as they want to. I mean, it's also great, I mean, I have, I'm looking a little bit further ahead um, at some architecture stuff, um, the um, Jewish architects who are building Jewish architects who are building uh, or designing um, synagogues in modern styles in the post-war period are saying modern means that it is Jewish. So to flip it right back around and say well, maybe it's not representational, but it doesn't have all these issues. You know, you've heard all this before. So it's yeah. it's it's a uh, um, it's a space of openness. Awesome. That, that's thank yes. Yeah, that's what you're <laughs> Thank you.